It's deemed the biggest natural disaster in Vermont history. Four years after Irene's fury, we're connecting with Marion Abrams and Rob Coyer, two local filmmakers who experienced the deadly storm, captured images we still struggle to wrap our heads around, and showed us how communities came together in a time of tragedy. Their story is sure to stir the raw emotion which still exists in our state. Marion and Rob, thank you so much for being here. What I wanna know first and foremost, media moguls, outside of the films that we're going to be discussing today, tell us about your other work. Rob, we'll start with you. Um, well, I've done five short films, a feature length film, two docs, and I also do, I've done maybe a hundred videos for uh, corporate and nonprofit clients wow. in, the, in the state and outside of the state as well. So it stretches across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. You're just not fully focused on film. How did you get started in all of this? Uh, I went to Burlington College actually as a film major and just right after that started uh, doing corporate work for some companies and things and as well as doing my own films and projects. Excellent. And right now up on the screen we're previewing some of your work and this okay. right here if you want to tell us about North Star. Now tell us about where that was featured. Um, that was I a part of the Vermont movie, Freedom Unity, the Vermont movie, which uh, Nora Jacobson was the executive producer on that. And um, yeah, it's one segment about uh, an escaped slave, a recreation of an escaped slave coming from the South up to New England. The Vermont movie, Freedom and Unity, talk about a major collaboration. That mm -hmm. was you and approximately how many other filmmakers came together for that? Uh, I don't know the final number. It started at 10. I think now it's at 40 filmmakers, probably. And that's like that. an awesome thing to do. Not only have your work be featured, but featured alongside of other passionate filmmakers. Mm. Marion, we're going to talk a little bit about your work outside of the film that we'll be speaking about today. What does your resume look like? Um, one of the great things about living in Vermont is that you can't be in too much of a niche. Sure. And uh, that works well for me. So um, I do a lot of different work, but I've been making my living doing film, you know, since before I got out of school. Um, right now, I'm on uh, a kind of a big project for Spartan Race, doing a, a weekly podcast series. And um, we've traveled all over the world, done 170 interviews in the last year, um, and we're releasing them once a week. So that's been pretty interesting. And uh, just other, you know, a huge variety of commercial projects. Sure, we're taking a look at some of those commercial projects right there. Simon Pierce and Glass Blowing, which yeah. is a Vermont staple. You each own your own business, which has to be tapping into so many limited resources. How do you go about budgeting for a film, commercial? How does the entire process come together? Uh, I think, well, it's based on the scope of the project, I'd say. You know, you've got a high budget concept, you budget high. Maybe it's something that's more intimate and smaller, you can budget low. Um, but then also at the end of the day, I guess for local projects, it's kind of based on what you can raise to make it happen, so. Marion. Yeah, I mean, for most of my commercial work, it just depends on, again, I mean, there's, a, there's kind of a huge spectrum. And um, what I have gotten really good at is getting I think good results with minimal budget um, and and again I've kind of come around to a place where I like that because I can be a little more hands-on and you know I don't need to be doing a Hollywood concept but I can have something that I'm really happy with my clients are happy with and you know we do that with modest resources and your clients must love the local component because you are here you are their neighbor for the most part would you say the same for you Rob are mm -hmm. most of your clients within our region yeah, yep, the majority of them, definitely, yeah. So how competitive is this industry? Looking at it from a Vermont standpoint, looking at it from a national standpoint, if someone was trying to break into this as a filmmaker, what would their chances be? I'd say right now it's more competitive than it ever has been mm. because of that democratizing effect of the technology. Mm. Um, it used to be if, if you could afford the actual equipment that was the barrier to entry into the business. Sure. Um, that isn't really there anymore. And so I think of it now more like being a writer. 
So you can be great at it, and you may not be commercially successful. You, you know, what makes you a great writer isn't whether you can buy the pencil or the pen or the, you know. So now it's a much o more open field. Well, I look at it as everyone has a smartphone in their hands. So people rip out their smartphone. We see it on social media. We see it on the news that people are just taking their phones and right. documenting stories and automatically associating themselves with Steven Spielberg. And, and just like writing, you know, sure. um, everybody's writing emails, but yes. some people write novels, some people are professional writers, some people are artists, um, you know, but everybody can write to the degree they can write. I mean, it's sort of... Do you think everyone has a filmmaker within them? They just need to hone in on those skills a little bit more, or do you think you should leave it to the pros? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think everyone has the capacity to be an artist, to create, to you know, express themselves creatively. I suppose some people are more naturally inclined to it than others, but I think if you go to school for it and you know, spend a lot of time devoting it to it, if you're not naturally inclined, you could do the same thing. Certainly. Yeah. And Marion, you were talking a little bit before about how everyone sort of has this access now. When right. you're a writer, you don't necessarily have to be the best writer, but you can still write. Yeah. Do you consider this a male-dominated male industry still to this day? You know, I, I statistically, I'm sure it is. It, it hasn't been relevant, and especially, you know, my background, I've worked a lot in, you know, multicam sports situations where there's a lot of guys there. Um, I, I just haven't, for, for me personally, it, it hasn't been that relevant it hasn't changed anything really but I, I guess there are probably more more guys doing it sure and if either of you had had to pick a particular piece which you felt was the most rewarding and it very well may be what we're here to discuss today but what is one piece that you are exceptionally proud of um, yeah well I guess strength of the storm sure. yeah um, I suppose I think because uh, aesthetically and artistically, um, I felt really happy with it, but then also it really has a strong story that resonates and inspires people and you know, gives them hope that these kind of dark, disastrous situations can also become transformative in a positive way in some ways. Certainly. I think part of the nature of, of the way I work and what I do is uh, whatever I'm working on, I'm really excited about, and I sort of it absorbs my full attention. So I, I'm not even really thinking about Floodbound right now, but I will say that um, that was something that I was really proud of and excited about. Um, production value wise, it wasn't my best work mm. uh, because I was so involved in it and it so involved in the story, but um, in terms of just capturing the story and seeing it through from start to finish. Certainly, and I mean, both of you have captured moments in time that we won't soon forget and coming up in the show we'll be taking a peek at both of your films we have sound and motion from those two films that I can't wait to get into but let's talk a little bit about Hurricane Irene as it stands no one knew the impact it was going to have and though it was downgraded to a tropical storm by the time it hit our state the statistics are staggering and Irene's punch was a fury there's no other way to really describe what she hit. I know we have a graphic, which we have in the back, which the control room is going to take. S six Vermonters were killed in the storm. 200 towns torn apart, 45 severely damaged, one of which was yours, Marion. Over 1,400 families were forced to find a new home. More than twice as many suffered damage to their homes. 7,000 people applied for federal assistance from FEMA. And I know that, Rob, your piece gets into the money aspect as well. Usually documentarians have to search for the story. However, this one presented itself right at your door. Marion, we're going to start with you and talk about Floodbound, your film. How did you know that this storm, the second it started raining, it continued to rain, how did you know that this was not your typical Vermont summer shower? We really didn't know until, um, you know, we'd heard the reports and we had prepared for power outages and things like that. We had no idea about the, the flooding coming and we really didn't know until a neighbor came to the house and she said, Man, I was driving down the road and, you know, I'm worried about you guys and you mm. should just go stay. We have a place you can stay. Why don't you go now? And 
We sort of still didn't think it was that big a deal, but I did look out in the yard and I saw that the rain was um, higher than it had ever been and it was predicted to continue to rise and it was rising quickly. And, um, but it really wasn't, you know, we left the house, we had to get out, the, the roads were closed, bridges were down, all that. It wasn't until the next morning, around five in the morning when I walked back to the house and it was just, you know, uh, I don't have a word for it. It, it was quite shocking. That's when it really sunk in. Shocking to say the least. And Pittsfield, your hometown, tiny town, just over 400 people at the yeah. time Irene hit. Talk to me a little bit about the community. Was yeah. there a strong sense of unity before Irene? I mean, Pittsfield is a small town, and so there is a strong sense of community in some ways, but there's also, you know, disunity. and. Um, there's not that much of an economy, so people are commuting to all different places, not necessarily sort of staying in town. We don't have our own school anymore. Um, so, you know, things are, sp are spread mm. apart a little bit. And now, do you not have your own school anymore because of the storm? Is that No, a, no. no. Okay. Prior to that, we didn't because the small population. Gotcha. So okay. what happens is kids go to different schools, and so you don't have that kind of central um, collecting place. Gotcha. What was going through your head besides I better grab my camera yeah well so I mean it really was um, spectacular really quickly how quickly people came together um, and so that first morning the storm came in on Sunday night um, you know power was out phones were out cell service was out roads were out um, but somehow seven o'clock in the morning Monday morning a huge percentage of the town showed up for a town meeting Wow. You know, word just spread by word of mouth, people going door to door. Mm. And, um, and that was the moment where um, things sort of turned positive. I mean, I, I, as difficult as it was and, and in some ways still is, I felt like um, I was really glad that my kids got to see this mm -hmm. because uh, if you watch the news, you do not see positive stories. And it was just a sense that people are good. And it was as sure. simple as that. People are good and I need to capture this. You don't see positive stories, and it's one thing to see the story on TV, but I imagine nothing would build empathy quite like living what you <laughs> and your kids did. Pittsfield became an island. It was isolated from bordering towns. Bridges were washed away. We're going to take a peek at your film, Floodbound, right now, just to paint a picture for us. My dad walked in. He had a rope or a strap and he went in with us and we ended up throwing that out to Jack and Heather. They threw me the rope and I missed. The current was just so strong that I didn't think that I had the strength. And the, the, by the third, the third time I got it, I grabbed it. I was scared, I was shaking, it was crazy. I never, you know, I'm lucky. I'm pretty lucky. That was pretty scary, and then about 20 minutes later, you could see the cars raising up and kind of doing a twirl and going downstream a little bit, you know? And then the house coming off foundation, and at that point, we didn't know how far the water was gonna come. You know, you know when you see your first house moving down the street in a, in, in a wall of water, yeah, it's pretty devastating. I realized, boy, we're, the kids hit the fan now, boy. We're, uh, we're gonna see some stuff we have never seen, you know? It hadn't affected me. It didn't hit me. I saw those pictures online, and I lost it. Because you didn't realize when you were in it, you didn't realize how bad it was. That's got to be difficult to watch. I wasn't there, and I have goosebumps all over my body. How do you continually relive that moment? I, I think, actually, uh, making the film was a little therapeutic for... for you know, for y years after that, I would get that goosebump feeling all the time. And now, I, now it, it no longer, it's finally, you know, I'm immune to it finally <laughs> after this much time and that many viewings. And I guess that's a good sign that uh, it doesn't have, it, it helped me deal with the emotional impact of, of the film. I can't I mean, of imagine. the events. The destruction, the devastation, yeah. the emotion, the woman we heard from in that last sound bite, you can't help not but be choked up. It was pretty intense. How did you decide to pick the 36 people who appear in your film? Obviously, it's a town of over 400, as we've said before, but why those 36 in particular? That's actually the hardest part, because I, um, one of the most remarkable things was 
almost without exception, everyone in town contributed. Mm -hmm. And really, I would have liked to interview everyone in town. And there are people that I didn't interview that I, I wish I had. Um, really, they were people that were in my immediate circle that I saw doing things that I interacted with. But even some that came to my house and helped me are not in the film. And um, I just, I had done, I think, 36, 38 interviews and sort of reached my capacity and sure. had to stop. But honestly, I wish I, I had interviewed more. Sure. But you got their stories out, and we can learn yeah. from those stories. Marion, thank you. Rob, we're going to switch gears over to you. And you were living in Burlington at the time mm -hmm. Irene hit. But your story takes us a little bit further downstate as well, another hard-hit area. You focus on a mobile home community, which is in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to cover that angle of the story? Um, well. I was, uh, so I was living in Burlington when Irene hit, and I was thinking about going out and doing some kind of film about it. And I went out um, a few different times, you know, because it's mainly uh, central Vermont and southern Vermont that was hit. Burlington wasn't even like a few limbs fell down from some trees or something like that, <laughs> but it wasn't hit at all really. Um, and then uh, James Haslam, who's the director of uh, Vermont uh, Worker Center. He's a friend of mine, and he. I talked to him, and uh, and he, there were worker center people were going out and um, helping people in the communities, um, you know, volunteering and helping with their recovery effort. And so I decided to go with them um, a few days, and we went to all over the state to lots of different areas, uh, filmed short interviews with people that had just lost their homes, and trying to sort of like, I was trying to figure out like, you know, what would be an interesting story or angle to take on this. Sure. And then um, there was this mobile home community in Berlin, Vermont, where I think it was 80 or 72 or something of the 80 homes. Anyway, most of the homes were destroyed beyond mm -hmm. repair. Um, the whole entire park was just filled with water, like a like a lake, basically. And uh, so I decided to start filming there, and then um, they ended up. Uh, working with the Vermont Workers Center to try and essentially change the situation, um, which they were hit with immediately after the storm, which was that they were all going to be required to pay $5,000 or something like that, different amounts of money to remove their damaged homes from their lots. So these were people that had lost everything. They're lower income people to start with. Sure. And now they're being asked to come up with $5,000 out of nowhere to just remove this damaged, destroyed home. So the Worker Center ended up working with them to um, organize and petition the state to cover the cost of the removal of their homes. And because of that was, to me, that was like uh, a story that shows how people can change things. And it also educates us about the what life is like for lower income people, for middle class people, what life is like for lower income people. Absolutely. And the effects of systemic poverty in our country. So I decided that. Um, you know, I wanted to focus on that and try and do a larger piece that covered, the, that talked about the storm, the recovery effort, and then the effects of organizing in these people's lives. And you did it justice. You both did. It's obviously the same story, just told through two different Barry lenses. But one of the common themes throughout is how the communities came together. Yours in the midst of the storm, Yours focuses a little bit more on the aftermath of the storm, but we want to get into a clip right now of your film, Strength of the Storm. We would have just gone and licked our wounds and done the best we could like we've always done, alone. But because we organized and we worked together and we ended up being successful and the money was there for us and it was provided for us to uh, have our mobile homes destroyed and taken away at no price to us. We must acknowledge that Vermonters living in mobile home parks are often the Vermonters who are least able to deal with this kind of disaster. Many of us are on fixed incomes. Some are living paycheck to paycheck. We don't have a lot of money in savings, but we are your neighbors. We are state workers. We are grandparents. We teach your children. We check you out in the grocery line or the bank. 
We pay taxes and vote. We have families and we have a right to housing and dignified lives just like everyone else. And that was a clip from Strength of the Storm, your film. Marion, before we saw a clip from Floodbound, your film. And for the folks at home, right there on your screen, that is going to be shown, both of those films in their entirety, entirety right here on Vermont PBS, August 27th, starting at 7 p.m. Rob, I want to get back to you for a moment. Is there a particular image that is just burned in the back of your brain, either that you captured on film or something that you might not have been able to gather video of, but you just constantly see that one image over and over? Um, well, I think for me, I, I feel like I knew that I had a film uh, on, one, on one instance when um, some of the people from the mobile home park went to a select board meeting in Berlin and Stephen Campbell, who's one of the uh, people that's featured in the film, um, he had brought a petition to the select board and asked them to sign it in support of them in their efforts to get the state to cover the removal of their damaged homes. Um, and the select board wouldn't sign it and they kind of didn't want to talk to them, they didn't want to deal with them. They had a condescending sort of attitude in the way they spoke to them even. Um, and for me, as uh, someone that's been more, mi you know, more middle class for at least uh, most of my life, I grew up more, more uh, lower class anyways. But um, that was a just kind of eye-opening just to see the, like, re in real time, you know, the effects of uh, the way people, uh, you know, talk to people that are lower income or just don't give them the same attention as the rest of us, basically. Well, and that's a theme throughout your film as well, the frustration, yep. the lack of communication from the government, from officials, from the town. I want to talk a little bit about, we saw it ever so much in that short clip from your film, and we're going to see it once again in your film as well, Marion. Talk about that sense of community. I know one image that stands out in my mind is when that young lady who was the last clip we heard from, she talked about how people were linking arms and sort of forming a human chain across this raging river in the middle of the street to rescue her. Are there any other examples that stand out in your mind of that communal rescue, that everyone is in it for everyone at that point. I would say that that was, that was the, in the experience in its entirety. Mm -hmm. That was not a, a unique, I mean, that was a very visual symbol of it, but um, it's such a small town that unlike this experience, it wasn't, there wasn't any sort of outside force to battle against. There is no outside force. Uh, we have a volunteer fire department. We don't have a school. We have, you know, everything in town is run by volunteers. And so as soon as um, the town was cut off, we had, you know, the town constable, which is really normally doesn't do much, but, you know, with lost dog reports or bite, dog bite or something, sure. was patrolling the town. We had anyone in town who was a ski patrol, a doctor, a nurse, a PA, um, cleaned out the library and stocked it as a medical facility. We had uh, people that owned restaurants, people that uh, owned the general store and the, the pit stop, and the Swiss farm market, um, all the stuff that was going to go bad because the freezers didn't work, they donated that, we had a massive cookout, e you know, the, the, the people in town um, that had excavating equipment used that equipment and we literally built our way back out to the outside world instead of waiting for the world to come in and, and rescue us and um, when the National Guard did land it was almost redundant, you mm. know, um, I mean they certainly helped with things but it was sort of like, you know, we've got this, we, we sure. you know. I'm sure the National Guard wanted to recruit <laughs> people from Pittsfield <laughs> at that point. It's, you had no other choice. You had to right. rally and rely on one another. Something that stands out in my mind in terms of this communal approach is when the folks from the mobile park homes are marching in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. That was astounding. Any other examples that you recall of such solidarity? Um, well, they, they didn't have to do this, but they were planning to do a sit-in at the Capitol, actually. <laughs> to, uh, just, really? Yeah, okay. just to stay there until their uh, demands were met, but they ended up getting it taken care of anyway. But, um, but yeah, definitely the sense of community was, was pretty extraordinary. 
and in a lot of ways it changed the landscape of the community as well. Like they talked a lot about how they didn't even know some people and now they're like best friends with them just because of the experience of coming together like that and then also organizing and working together. You never want to say, are things back to normal at this point, but in Pittsfield, is everything back to normal at this point? Um, in the sense that, you know, socially, everybody's back to being, you know, annoyed by everybody's, you know, you know, the, the, the love has, <laughs> the love, the, the utopian feeling has faded. Um, we're back to normal in that sense. Um, all the houses, I think, that were destroyed have been cleared. Um, our house, you know, in the sense that probably is not back to normal. Um, there's a couple places where, you know, just in terms of resale values and, and uh, being sort of stuck in a little bit of a limbo. Uh, but for the most part, things are, you know, we actually, it, it is almost never talked about anymore. It's In fact, people are kind of like, we're sort of done with it. We sort of have had enough. Mary and Rob, <laughs> thank you so very much both for being here. And thanks to you folks at home as well. Once again, these films will be shown here on Vermont PBS August 27th, starting at 7 p.m. And we want to keep the conversation going with you. You can always reach out with feedback and ideas at connect at vermontpbs.org and get caught up on episodes and extra material at vpt.org. See you next time.